There we go, and that's for our online audience. Um, a huge welcome to you all here at the Blavatnik School of Government. I'm Nairi Woods, and I'm Dean of the school. Um, and I partly wanted to say thank each and every one of you for making this year's Social Outcomes Conference such a success. It's a fantastic event. What I particularly love about the way the Government Outcomes Lab run this event is that it spawns so many collaborations, experiments, collaborative research afterwards. And sitting as Dean at school, I see year on year, this lovely snowballing of collective endeavors so that we can really learn about how to do this better. And probably one of the most important areas is the topic of, of the conversation that Carolyn and Margaret are about to have, which is public-private partnerships. Because at their best, what a heavenly combination, all the public mission and purpose of government married with all the effectiveness and innovative means of the private sector. And yet what a terrible combination when instead of getting the best of each, you get the worst of each. You get the predatory price gouging of the private sector married to the bureaucratic lack of responsiveness of the public sector. And tonight's conversation, I know, is going to be enlightening on both what good and bad can look like and how we can move towards good. So I really just wanted to step in at this point in the conference to say how much as a school we value your collaboration with us, your participation in this conference, and to say a very special welcome to a very special um, public servant of the United Kingdom, Dame Margaret Hodge who has dedicated a life after studying and working in parts of the private sector to public service um, in Islington at the local level and then at national level as an MP, as somebody who served in various ministerial roles. But then I think as you'll hear more about today as an absolutely formidable chair of the Public Accounts Committee of the Parliament, an absolutely crucial role about which she has written a brilliant book, which I would recommend to all of you. And in conversation with Dame Margaret today is Carolyn Heinrich. Professor Carolyn Heinrich has been this last year's Eastman Visiting Professor, um, a fantastic scholar who throughout the whole year has helped inform, lead, inspire research in the school, and who alongside being a brilliant scholar, is somebody who brings a real magic to collaboration by being a trusted, calm, uh, brilliant collaborator. So what better pair to um, have the conversation with tonight? Thank you so much to both of you and a big welcome to the school here tonight, Dame Margaret. Thank you both. Well, let me thank um, Dean Woods for a very warm introduction and um, also to thank you. It's an honor to be up here with you, um, Dean Margaret Hodge. And uh, I, um, if you haven't read the book yet, Called to Account, I recommend it. Um, after we were talking, I said I read it. Um, Margaret asked me if I thought anything was out of date. I said, absolutely not. <laughs> and um, actually, I don't know if you mind me sharing this, but on the, the back side of the, of the book, you know, you have uh, people offer comments kind of in, in support of the book. And I thought this, I thought this comment was priceless and about specifically about you, um, Dame Margaret Hodge, it says, she's a bit like a tarantula. You don't want to become intimate with it, but you admire its danger and grace. <laughs> and, you know, her book is just an amazing um, account, as I said, of, of some of the challenges um, as well as opportunities we have in, in public-private partnerships. And in, as, you know, Dean Woods mentioned, the potential for an amazing combination, but that sometimes goes greatly wrong. And it's, it's one of the reasons why we um, are focused on, focusing on public-private partnerships. They're ubiquitous. We see them in all sectors now and um, increasingly in areas that we, we didn't used to see previously, very challenging areas of social welfare services and others that um, involve many partners and a lot of complexity. And so, um, 
you know, one of the things we've come to understand is that the complexity requires more capacity, um, both in government and on part of the partners to execute well. Um, and so we, we want to talk about that. But one of the things I want to first talk about with you is some of the work you did. And, we, you know, we're going to start by looking at some of the ways things didn't work out, right? Um, some of the failures. And the, some of the, the quotes in, in the book are, are absolutely um, extremely informative and insightful. And one of, and I, we could pick any number of examples um, to talk about, but one of the particular public-private partnerships that Dame Margaret um, Hodge worked on was um, a, a project that was in the Ministry of Justice. It involved um, firms that were uh, taking prisoners, right? So once they are released, um, and they have to be tagged for a certain amount of time. And it turns out they were billing and charging the taxpayers, right, for not taking, not take for taking people who weren't, some people who weren't ever in prison, some people who were no longer even, I guess, alive. And, um, but what's interesting, so it was a scandal that was brought to attention. And, um, and then there were supposedly some changes that were made. And then, uh, when Margaret's team um, brings people to account in a public hearing, um, the provider is asked, uh, or and and so the providers are asked to kind of explain what happened. And you know, one of the things the provider says um, is, "Well, you know, we made judgments on a complex contract that were inappropriate. The contract was open to interpretation. We made the wrong judgments that led us to overbilling." So, you know, they made some misjudgments, but then the, there was some attempt to correct that. And then it was asked if those actions, did the overbilling reduce after 2009, after they tried, or did it go up? And the response is, well, it increased. And so we had a new system that was tended to bring down costs, but overbilling actually went up. Yes. So I thought you might want to share a little bit more about this example. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the more shocking contracts, especially when we discovered that they charged for they charged for tagging prisoners who had died. I mean, it was quite extraordinary that they got away with it for years and years and years. But I mean, I suppose in a way, I want to start a little bit back from it because um, this this is a really interesting conference. Although I'm, I'm a great skeptic as to what uh, um, what progress you can make in trying to get sort of cooperative and joint working between the private and public sector. And I'll come to that. But I do think um, when I wrote this book, this is now five years ago, more than five years ago, over 50% of public services in the UK, and that you take out all sort of transfer payments and tax and all that sort of stuff. So it's absolutely public service. Over 50% of public services are provided by third party providers. And that was then. Now, I think we're probably at 60 or 70 percent. And private providers have always been there, um, you know, building aircraft carriers or providing computer equipment or even providing paper to uh, the public sector. So there's, all, there's always been a private sector. But this uh, it's spread now into the delivery of public services in a way we've got to make it work. So um, I've never been ideological on this. I'd, all my life, I'm sort of seen on the left, but even going back to my Islington days when we built a massive housing program, and this is back in, this is a long, long time ago, late 70s. Um, and it never occurred to me to think about, should I have a direct labor organization in those days? They, they were popular doing it. What I needed to do was provide decent homes at a price people could afford as quickly as I could. And that meant using private contractors to do that. It was never an ideological thing. So I think from the from this conservative government, it's been very ideological all the way through. And that's a mistake. There is still on the left an ideology that public is good, um, uh, private is bad. You can see it with the argument renationalizing the railways. That might be one example. Interestingly enough, Boris's bikes were provided very efficiently by a private sector organization. So the whole thing is completely absurd, but it's there. So we've got to deal with it and make it work. 
And I love to think, I love to think that all those, all those private sector organizations that I've come across in my many years of looking at this and the ones who gave evidence, I'd love to think that they were really social purpose organizations and therefore had a shared vision of um, they're using taxpayers' money to provide efficient, effective, and economical public services. I don't think you'll get there, and I think you have to use other tools um, to try and ensure that taxpayers' money provides the social pub purpose, the public good to which it was intended. I mean, before we came in, we were just having a conversation. I think there are actors in the NGO sector who have, who have that shared public purpose. And I was thinking of an organization like Save the Children, providing um, uh, uh, services in, uh, in developing countries. That might, be, that might be something. But beyond that, I just don't think I ever came across a private sector organization that I can genuinely say shared that public sector purpose. Now, that's a bit tough, and there may be people here who disagree with that. So that's why I think we have to think through. I think you have to think through. Of course, you want a strong relationship. Of course, you want to talk to each other. Of course, you want to try and do what you can together. But at the end of the day, you have to use the tools that you can to ensure that taxpayers' money is used for the purpose that it was intended to provide that public service. I'll start there. I mean, I can go on about what the tools are, but I think there's start there but that shocking story I mean let me tell you one of the I can't remember which is the worst stories we heard but one of the ones one of the terrible things and I, I still work on this because I now do economic crime but a lot of this comes to light through whistleblowers and whatever you do legislatively to protect a whistleblower you really can't because at the end of the day even though they may have statutory sort of rights uh, surrounding uh, the, the fact they blow the whistle. They've got to go back into the place of work where they have actually uh, revealed something. And I just think that is an impossible thing to do. Um, I mean, I'll tell you a funny story. Am I allowed a bit of a funny story about it? Is that there was, uh, we, when I first became chair of the Public Accounts Committee, uh, David Davis, the Conservative, came up to me and he said, Vodafone, Margaret, you've got to look at Vodafone's tax affairs. And I sort of stared at him, but what on earth have the tax affairs of a private company got to do with the, uh, the, the work that, uh, that we were doing, which was overseeing public, public expenditure? But it soon became clear to me that it goes to the heart of the efficiency of HMRC. So we held HMRC to regular account. And I remember one Sunday sitting there with a thick wad of papers that the National Audit Office had provided, really boring stuff. Uh, and I thought, what on earth are we going to do tomorrow? And then I happened to read Private Eye. And Private Eye had got the fact that um, the tax office had come to a, a, a sweetheart deal with Goldman Sachs. Um, so the next day, we uh, I thought, oh, that sounds more interesting. So we interrogated the head of tax on that. And he... He, and we'll come to this. He said, I can't tell you anything commercial confidentiality, uh, uh, the interests of taxpayers are uh, uh, private. Um, and then he said, I had nothing to do with it. And at the end of that session, which I thought was very unsatisfactory, my clerk passed me a thick brown envelope, which was from a whistleblower, it was from a lawyer who worked at HMRC. And I was very tired, but he said, look at it, look at it. And there was one sheet of paper in there, which were the minutes of the meeting that the head of law had in HMRC had had on the day after the deal was struck, um, in which the head of law said that the head of tax had shaken hands on the deal. So the guy had misled, in polite terms, Parliament, and that it was an unconscionable deal. And then we hauled the guy back. We hold them both back, and they both hid behind confidentiality of taxpayers' interests, wouldn't tell us anything. And then my conservative vice chair said to me, put him on oath, Margaret. And I was quite new to the job, and I thought, I can't do that. He said, yes, you can. So I turned to the clerk and said, can I put him on oath? And he said, yes, you can. So I said, well, go and find a Bible. <laughs> and it took them 20 minutes to find a Bible <laughs> in the whole of the Palace of Westminster. Uh, when they eventually did, we didn't get much more. But we did hit the six o'clock news that night. And that led to a whole lot of people coming to talk to us 
about other things, but it just showed that whistleblower, I tried to defend for the whole of my five years, but they rifled his, compu his computer to look for data. This was HMRC. They looked at his phone, his marriage broke up, and in the end, he left HMRC. And I think that's a really difficult thing. And that, that, I think the book is full of other stories where whistleblowers who do come forward um, are, there's no, I, I haven't got an answer to it because I don't think it is a legislative answer. I mean, one can try and sort of provide a little bit of more moral support, but it's a real problem if we want to uh, ensure value in the public space. Absolutely. One of the things we've been talking about at this conference is how you center public value in contracting relationships, especially when they involve the public and private sector. One of the things I also appreciate about your book is you do hold both sectors accountable. You brought the private sector people in to say, and you brought the public sector people in, and you noted the deficiencies in both, right? So there's some laxness in oversight and management. You know, we procure and we let them go. And then there's the, like you said, the, um, the, I guess, naturally aligned interests towards profits or towards, you know, maximizing what you can out of the contract. And so I think um, it's, it's very helpful. And it brings us to this question of if we really do want to do a better job of centering public value in these contracting relationships, um, you know, what are the opportunities and tools we have? We've talked, you know, here a lot about outcomes-based contracts. But also you can, as we, we've also talked about the fact that you can have several thousand page contracts that ultimately don't serve the purpose well. And so I don't know if you have, can share a little about your thoughts on, you know, what, what might hold promise in this area? Where, where can we go towards better contracting centered on public value? It's a very complex area. So I try and divide it up. It's a, it's a way of trying to look at things. And I think if you think about transparency would be one pillar. You think about smart regulation, none of us want too much regulation would be a second pillar. You then need very good enforcement. And then you finally need proper accountability. And I think it's, it's one way of, of cutting it, uh, which I find helpful when I think about these things. So, you know, on trans, uh, and it's a bit sad, I haven't been involved in the, there's just this new procurement bill that's gone through, but I think it's an opportunity missed to have done, tried and actually just strengthen really. And this is all about, this isn't anti-private, pro-public, it's just about ensuring that that value is given and the service uh, meets its social purpose. So I think on transparency, it's I think if you're a private contractor wanting to play in the public space, you should accept that you've got to have transparency. It doesn't mean right through all your business, but that part of your business that relates to the um, uh, providing of public services, that ought to be transparent. And that means it ought to be subject to FOI and it ought to be subject to the National Audit Office being able to look at it from a value for money perspective. And I think that completely, that would be the first transformation uh, that I would do. And in the discussions I had at the time with big players like Serco, who were, you know, who's, I didn't, you know, I, I don't know what the figure is today, but, you know, most of their businesses, public sector, con uh, public contracts, they were happy with it. The people who weren't happy were the civil servants, the departments and the ministers. Actually, you never know whether it's the, it's the civil servants or the ministers. They were the ones resisting that account. But I think that oh, transparency is an incredibly powerful way of, 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 of enhancing, raising qualities. And that's the first thing uh, that I would do. And then the second thing is um, civil service. So um, I, it's changed a bit but it hasn't changed enough. People go into the civil service because they, they're policy wonks. So they like to, we all love to dream up new policies and um, think about how we can make the world a better place through policy. And there is absolutely, they don't go in to really run services. They do more in local government. Local government is a different culture, but in, in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, 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 in the civil service, it's very much about your you are your status and your esteem comes your a bit from your ability to to deal with policy challenges um and and one of the interesting sessions we had 
was with permanent secretaries who get claimed to give us evidence on how they manage private contracts. They had never throughout their whole career in coming to become a, a perm sec, had they ever had responsibility for overseeing a contract. It was just not part of what they'd done. So we have to change the esteem, not just the skills and the knowledge that you need to be a civil servant, but you have to change the esteem in which working on letting contracts and then even more important, monitoring those contracts is held. And the monitoring of contracts is really has some very little. It's seen as a totally, you know, you're not, you're not well regarded by your colleagues if you're doing the monitoring of contracts. So we have to change that. And we also have to change there so that people stay with a job for longer in the civil service. You still change your job every couple of years. When I was children's minister, which I, I think I was there for about two and a half, three years, and Tony Blair changed us far too often as well. But I had more institutional memory at the end of my two and a half years than any of the civil servants with whom I was working. Scary. It's just scary. And they've got to change that whole career trajectory so that, you know, you come in, you're responsible for letting a contract, and then you're responsible for monitoring it to see that it gives the outcomes that you want to. So I think there's a whole sort of stuff um, around that. The third area was the whole one of the reasons people like to have the private sector is you want a bit of competition in the in the field. You want to see whether you know uh, two or three organisations delivering the same their, the competitive edge ought to improve both value for money and effectiveness. But the truth is, if you look at it, is there isn't much of a market anywhere in the private sector for delivering public services. And even you, where you start with one very quickly, there are. Um, uh, the PFI was classic, the PFI market is classic, where it just, you know, uh, a builder will build and then immediately sell off to sell it off to somebody else. They're just out art is not a proper market. So you need to create, and this is a tough one. I haven't got the answer to it. I think it's a challenge we have to look at, but you need to create a market. And particularly the SMEs are completely frozen out of any, particularly with central government, of doing any work because um, you know, when you're running a big sort of NHS service, I mean, think about it all. The idea that you're contracting with a small, effective NGO in a particular, uh, with a particular area of specialisation is really difficult to do. This came home to me most when they privatised the welfare to work, where um, uh, there were a lot of really good uh, voluntary sector players in that space at the time. You know, again, it, provided by both public and private. And they were all killed off as the big boys, mainly boys, uh, took over took over that market. So I think you have got, to, if you're serious about it, you've got to try and um, uh, uh, create a market. And then the other things I, I would talk thing about is, it is absolutely absurd. And I remember once civil servant, I can't remember, it was on, it was on universal credit, I think, or something. Um, if a, if a company, if you've got a builder who makes a mess of your house, you don't employ the builder again. It's just absolutely so straightforward. If your government, you have a, a, somebody who screws up and then you invite them back and you, you know, uh, and then they screw up on the next contract. It's completely daft. And the perm sex said to us, I cannot under the procurement rules exclude um, a player, well, you know, write the procurement rules in a way which allows you to have regard to the performance record of the company that you're trying to uh, bring in. So I do a whole piece of uh, work around that. And then I think also um, we've got to look at sort of, I mean, these are probably um, less in, intra-company transactions are really scary. If you look at the academy school structure here in the UK, um, that that is a scary territory which we're not overseeing properly. It's not being held to proper account. Where the people who become trustees and and owners of these then give themselves contracts, whether as lawyers or whether as builders or in or whether as uh, 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 estate manage, managing the estates. And you know, there's a really scary intra-company. Um, culture that has emerged in some parts of the company of the public sector into company uh, transactions which i think you should get rid of too and then there's all sorts of other things like which open you up to corruption revolving doors 
party to political party donations, uh, the whole of the COVID saga, which will be familiar to most of you, where um, all it, outrageous how much, how many billions there went to the friends of, uh, of uh, conservative um, leading politicians. Um, in that, you know, they had they had two lines, and it, it went. It was a priority, basically, full of people who were recommended by politicians who had no no record at all in delivering those particular services and still got them. So I think there are some things that are more than just efficiency and economy. I think there are things that are verging on. I mean, corruption is probably too strong a word, but they are things which are wrong. And then I think I'd sort of finally say. Um, in my view, I was, there's got to be a sort of, I, I really regret that the government has sort of failed not to have a, an issue of principles at the top of the procurement. So when you come in and say, I'm going to deliver whatever it is, care in the community, welfare to work, something in prisons, whatever you're doing, you've got to have that, those principles about public um, uh, purpose, social purpose, at the heart, that's your purpose if you're going to contract. That, that's what this is all about. And having a set of principles which would have that and would also exclude those who, for example, um, choose to put their profits into uh, uh, foreign jurisdictions to avoid tax or get involved in even other sort of financial misdemeanors and are bad actors. I just don't think they should, I don't think we should be doing uh, business with them. Um, uh, so I think if we just, those are the sort of tools that I would explore to make this thing work better. Now, obviously, if you can work in partnership, it's great. And obviously, you should always strive for that. But I think the idea that there is a shared purpose might end you up, a, uh, you know, putting your effort into something you can't achieve rather than getting these other tools effective in a way which will really improve the delivery of public services from private providers. Sorry, it's a very long answer. Well, those are all excellent points. And actually, I mean, it's it's not just reflective of UK, I can relate to everything you said in the US. And just to give one example where these things fit together, you mentioned welfare to work, right? And so we had a point in, in the United States where we changed our welfare system and invited uh, private participation from a system that just was all public and, and cut checks for people uh, who are needy. And um, and we saw the field, as you say, kind of get swallowed up into one large firm that still today is dominates the entire market. Um, there's been press on lots of concerns uh, about how things are done. In fact, uh, you know, when this first kicked off, um, we were in a in the late 1990s in a, a time of rapid economic growth. And so those firms actually made you know, good money um, because they were able to, you know, the caseloads were going down. And then we had a recession shortly after and uh, well, they came up short and guess what? The government has to step in. So you kind of wonder, well, if you were thinking like a firm, what would you have done with those profits? Maybe save some for a rainy day or invested back in. And so we weren't seeing those kinds of public service oriented responses and you know ultimately the government in these circumstances has the obligation right to deliver the service so the fact that the the, the private providers did not have the resources to do it the government had to step in and backfill that but it's it's you know, just one example and i think your 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 you know discussion of the lack of a competition we see that in some of the biggest most expensive yeah. contracts uh, like Dave Van Slyke's work on, on defense. And it's, it's just, uh, you know, those are again, complex yeah. um, circumstances. Yeah. And as you said, you, you can't, you can't really um, let your guard down, right. In a yeah. sense and, and transparency for some of the reasons you mentioned is, is challenging when private providers say, well, I'm sorry, that's, you know, our, our, business um, innovation details that we don't want publicly shared. That's, you know, kind of our secret recipe. And, um, and then that unfortunately creates, as you say, barriers to transparency. And so I think it's, it, all of your points were, were very well taken. One thing you mentioned that I thought was very interesting was you talked about getting principles 
up front and centered in the contract. And one of the things we've been talking about here at this conference has been the potential for some kind of blend of formal and relational contracting. And I think, I think especially when we're talking about really important public sector um, responsibilities and obligations, core services to the, that, that the government does for the public, we can't think of something entirely relational, right? We're always going to have to have um, formal elements and, and mechanisms for accountability and enforceability. You also mentioned the importance of enforcement. But I'm curious to hear some of your thoughts on how those principles um, might build some of the informal or relational part of a contract that might make it easier for us to, I mean, for example, could you, um, have in those principles something about transparency that would force the private firms to relax a bit their kind of restrictiveness about access to their to their information that they use in in developing their products and services. I, well, I, I would mm -hmm. uh, indeed, and remember they choose to play in that field. Absolutely, they choose to play in the field. That was always my you know. So if you don't want to play in the field. Um, uh, if you are, if you do, you play by those rules. And our experience, I don't know if it's right in the States, because our experience when we talked to them, and God knows whether they meant it or not, was they were quite happy to be much more transparent. It really was government, and whether that was ministers or was that, you know, again, you can, there's a whole other argument about their lack of transparency of who, who is actually accountable between the permanent civil service and the ministers. Um, but um, they told us it was from them. And certainly we looked at some of those, uh, some of there was a whole lot of contracts about, you know, uh, certainly in the Department of Work and Pensions was absolutely chockable. They were the most secretive of how they awarded contracts. I mean, it's the whole the awarding of contracts, which is the COVID stuff. So I would absolutely make transparent. Transparency is the, probably the most powerful tool. Mm -hmm. Probably the, the better we, it's the most powerful of, any, of anything. And shared purpose, I mean, I'm just trying to think. Has it, maybe somebody has got an example. So, so some of them that have been set forward by actually people in the private sector that have kind of also led on thinking about the idea of, of uh, relational contracting. Tim Cummins was here um, and uh, David Friedlinger was, was, was here. And, so there they, they talk about things like fairness, reciprocity, trust, um, you know, similar along those lines, right? Can we, for example, uh, can we agree on principle that when um, there's a disruption, like, like let's say COVID, right, which disrupted a lot of, of contracts, can we come to the table and agree to be fair? and how we you know, maybe have to renegotiate things or the changes we make. Um, can we be cooperative and not try to um, shade each other you know, or, or take advantage of, of someone's position, hope withhold information that would be important to doing things better or well? So I think, I think it's, you know, and, and of course, there's there, uh, one of the things that Tim Cummings said um, while he was here was he said, actually, you know, most business contracts initially were relational. So as we globalized, we became more formalized. And so he saw it as kind of going back to some principles that you know, would help people work through challenging circumstances, which always happens, right? Because it, it, it is one of the things about the public sector. There's a lot of external forces, right? And these aren't simple products where most often, sometimes they are, but, but there are a lot of you know, complexities. And so in the face of those complexities, can we come together to the table and can we act cooperatively? And, but this is, again, like you said, can you trust, right, that they will set aside certain self-interests and be an honest broker, um, an honest collaborator? And so, yeah, I don't know what your perspectives are on. And, you know, uh, it's, it sounds fine in theory. I just, is there an example <laughs> in practice? Is there an example of somebody got a an example from their work where they've found where have they found it to to work i mean what worries me a little bit about sort of so-called relation relational mm -hmm. um, relationships you know what what we're un what i'm now uncovering when and i'm in the much more dirty money arena is how um relations actually 
um, bring sort of, you know, corruption in the allocation of, um, so, you know, you, you in, in the allocation of contracts and in the decisions that are made by the public sector, whether it's party political funding or whether it's um, uh, uh, just, you know, if you think of all the uh, developers, the, the construction industry, and the sort of very close relationships that emerged that, you know, accrued benefit to the contractor for goodness knows what benefit. I'm, so I'm worried. It sounds all great. I mean, that's my transparency. I go back. This transparency is so important. It's great to have a good relationship. It's great to feel that you're you're all pushing in the same direction. But would I trust it? And I don't think I would trust it if there wasn't transparency. And I've got to just say something else. One of the things that shocked me, I got quite shocked in the five years I was doing this, because I'm a great believer. I mean, I've been, oh, sorry. I'm a great believer in public service and I'm a great supporter of the civil service. I worked for the civil service. I was a minister through all but one of the Brown Blair years. And you work best, if you look at that relationship, if you work cooperatively and open and partnership and all that sort of stuff, that's how the system works best. Is the number of people who lie to you? You know, so you come, you know, there was a terrible contract uh, this was a, for out of our service. Do you, uh, do you remember this one in the GPs out of our service? Yeah. Where um, I, I won't name the contractor. It had been run by local doctors. And a, 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 one of the specialists in winning government contracts got the contract. And they basically lied about how quickly they answered the phone when people in, in it was in Cornwall, how, you know, when people rang up in out of our services. They lied about how quickly uh, they got a doctor to people who were at home extremely ill. And when there was a whistleblower who blew the whistle, which is, you know, to a local paper, and then it got, went up and up and up, finally got to us. When there was, what was their response? To rifle the lockers of all their staff to find out who the hell the whistleblower was. Um, and these guys, because the contract was so bloody badly written, got away with bonus payments, even after, even after I think it was hundreds, hundreds of, of, of uh, examples, whoops, of where they, sorry, I'm scared of losing that, of where they had uh, lied about their, um, lied about the data. Oh, and I think you, I think, sorry, I'm being a bit negative. No, I think you, know, I think you actually touched on in your book a concern that we have talked about throughout the conference, and you use the term cozy, right? You can, you want to build relationships, but you don't want them to be too cozy and then, you know, take advantage of, of those circumstances. And, and, and it has been seen over and over again. Um, but I do think I want to kind of uh, just kind of reiterate what you were saying. I think that you made really important points. We need more transparency and that can be accomplished. Um, what you did in your work um, in terms of accountability, I think you set a high standard and a high bar. And you also had, as I said, expectations for the civil service to also, you know, step up um, to their game. You know, we, we need to make contracting, as you said, more, I mean, it's not as simple as, it's not like the people sometimes say accountants as being counters. And we know it's much more complex. It's a similar thing with, with contract management, right? It's not a matter of just checking the boxes to make sure they did it. There's much more yeah. as you illustrate that goes on. And then, you know, again, having uh, more competition um, and, and things that, that, you know, have to, will probably sector by sector um, be different how we move toward those changes. But I know we, you have um, to catch a, a cab and not that long, and we want to have some time for audience Q&A. So um, I am going, at first, maybe we'll take a question. I don't know if there are questions piling up in Zoom, Michael, or do you, do you want to throw one out in Zoom and then we'll open to the audience to give them a first shot? Yeah, great. So we have a question from Alessia who asks, um, we've talked a lot about the changes that we can make in government. Is there some kind of changes we could make within the private sector that could support better public-private partnerships? Um, well, I suppose this actually just to get you to get some cooperation and things. One of the things that goes wrong with contracts is that the civil servants, in a sense, because they're so removed from the delivery, tend to sort of do an unrealistic gold-plated contract design, unrealistic gold-plated contracts 
too often, sadly. And I suppose if it in the pre-contract negotiation, if, as long as this were all transparent, otherwise it's cozy. So you've got to do it in a in an open way. Of, of, I think that would help. You know what what can we do, rather than the civil service sort of. You know, we did come across too much gold plating. Um, so that would be one thing. Um, I mean, I'm very keen on people moving from, you know, jobs to get the skills, to, you know, get a skills transfer. What you have to watch is the revolving door in that. I mean, I'll give you the worst example I had of the revolving door was it, it wasn't around contract. It was around a tax relief where it was in my time when I was actually... Um, culture minister we introduced a film we, we no it wasn't my it was another tax relief I'm trying to think what the earth it was called we got the, um i can't remember the name it was a tax relief that was brought in because people were invented people had patents and they were leaving them on the shelves and they weren't converting them into businesses and and jobs and so um gordon brown introduced a tax relief that was supposed to uh, encourage businesses to take it off the shelf and, 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 and use it to grow the economy. Can't remember what it's called. It'll come back to me in a minute. And a guy from one of the big four came in to write the technical rules for that tax relief what, because those skills don't exist either in Treasury or in HMRC. Spent six months there. Uh, or, um, patent box, it was called the patent box tax relief. Spent six months there, wrote the rules. They went through Parliament. We don't have that expertise. He went back to hit the, one of the big four and immediately put, produced a brochure saying, patent box, what's in it for you? And it became a tax avoidance scheme. Absolutely exploited. didn't lead to... So whilst one wants that exchange, I think the answer has to be, again, transparency on everything. You know, if it's open and, and clear, then it, that it's less likely to lead to bad actors behaving badly. So I would a bit of that. What else could the private sector do? I mean, you know, open up. It is opening up, isn't it? It's sort of opening up. I'm trying to think what else I would ask of them. Um, helping. Uh, and then maybe if a contract is wrong, rather than seeing any change in a contract as being a reason to get screw more money out of the public purse, just to, you know, see it as a way of improving the quality of the service. But always think the way I look at public services is, and we're not, none of us are really good at this, is putting the citizen at the heart. And there might be something around this. So, you know, all these, uh, you know, we, we all live in our little silos and you think about everything within your silos. If you try and put the citizen at the heart of what you're trying to deliver, it gives you a different way in which you configure public services and it breaks down professional and departmental silos. And maybe if there was a way, this is just an idea, really, which you could explore of saying, OK, let's put the citizens in the heart of this. And you're going to have sort of private public people around it. How can we configure that in a way that actually ensures the citizen is there? It's a new, uh, there'd be an interesting research endeavor. Yeah. We had some discussion of that on a, one of the panels um, today where they were talking about how they were talking to the people who would be served to ask them what would be a good outcome. And then using that to help inform the menu of outcomes yeah. that they would go to in yeah. developing the contract, yeah. the public private contract. Um, other questions from the audience here? Yes. Hi, I'm Emily. I work at Oxfordshire County Council. Um, I wondered, you mentioned that the culture at lo in local governments is slightly different around procurement and policy development. I wonder if you could talk about what we can learn from local government in the way that they do kind of policy development and um procurement kind of more in tandem well this is a whole other area of, uh, of of public service reform in local government the process of developing policies well you know it is much more open and you don't have this crazy system that we have at, in central government where civil servants are accountable to ministers who are then accountable to parliament so the chief executive in local government and the chief finance officer has an accountability to council that jumps over the politicians. Uh, and I think that is a really healthy way of making policy. I don't think it takes the politics out of policy making, but I think it enables you to question 
uh, uh, underlying policies before they become set in stone and come out with better answers. I mean, we would have never privatised the probation service um, if there had been that more open debate about, you know, is that a good idea? So there are all sorts of things. And we have this crazy ministerial code here in uh, which goes back to, you know, whenever, whenever, uh, which I think, I think it's much, much better. So the openness is much, much better. And that comes from the civil servants in local government being able to report without having to get the agreement, um, without having to go through their politicians. That's at the heart of what. And then I, the other thing, it's just a smaller pond. So in the smaller pond, I mean, you know your community, you know your local private providers, where they're there. I mean, one of the things that really got my goat, I remember this on the, on the welfare to work, that um, I went, we were having a session and I thought I'll go and see the ones locally. And I had two organizations locally. One was a disability organization that had been around for years. The other one was a church-based organization and they provided a lot of the pro, uh, 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 welfare to work services uh, uh, in, you know, to the job center. So they'd been contracted. They were private providers. And in had come this company, it was called A for E, and they got you know, a quarter of the total countries because DWP couldn't negotiate with his, these two little organizations down there. They gave the contract to a big organization. So I had A3 there and I said, what are you doing? So they took 10% off. Basically 10% went on their profit. And that 10% meant there were fewer advisors. So if you put the citizen at the heart, there was less advice for individual citizens who were, who were trying to get work. So I said, what are you doing for your 10%? They said, oh, well, we, we find all the job vacancies in Tesco. And I thought, you know, what do they think that this, of course, both the disability organization and the church organization had a relationship with the local Tesco and the local Sainsbury's and used their vacancies. And ironically, I then remember I was really cross. I then went back before and we looked up this company. We found most of the business was public sector business. And the owner had taken an 8.6 million dividend the year before uh, we were going, um, uh, just the year before we had the inquiry. Uh, uh, so I used that as a bomb under her. <laughs> Questions way back, yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. oh, he's going to run a microphone to you. So I just wanted to dare to suggest a positive recent example of government private contracting. Um, Good. <laughs> Good. Um, the uh, holiday activity and food program that the government's done in the past couple few years seems to me to have been quite effective at delivering this in partnership with sort of very small private and voluntary sector providers. I think partly that might have been because it went through local government yeah. as part of that, but it'd be interesting to know whether you thought it's successful and what other parts of government could potentially learn from that. It, I, to be absolutely honest, I haven't, um, it hasn't hit my radar, which is interesting, but I'm sure that's right. If you go through, I mean, when, when I was in government, it was quite interesting that we were sort of trying to establish Sure Start and all those programs. Um, uh, and uh, we were trying to, a youth offer as well. We tried to establish a youth, uh, uh, and we were trying, the various things. I brought in, this was an interesting, I brought in three people who'd, one who was voluntary sector, one who'd worked in local government, uh, and two voluntary sector and one local government to help us deliver that because they knew much more about how to deliver. And we did that successfully. And I always say, like, sure start for me as an example, I thought when, when, we, when we did it, I thought, great, this is a new frontier of welfare state. And what I had never understood was how quickly it could be undone. Um, and I think one of the reasons for that, ironically, was that it was a non-statutory local government service. We gave it to local government. And then when the cuts started happening in local government, they had to cut the non-statutory. It was just disappeared. So I learned something out of that. There are times when you don't want to give it away too soon because then it uh, it could, if you care about that particular service being embedded in your um, society, it could it could go. But then if you if you use, I mean, that's an example. I wonder how how did are you a, a 
That's civil servant. No, I'm not. But so how did they jump from the, they gave the money to local authorities who then, well, that's fine. That's a way of doing it. That's fine. That's great. But they don't do that very often. They don't trust local government. And yeah. I, think, I think that supports the point, though, that yeah. at the local level, there's already some built-in yeah, relational aspects yeah. of it, right? And that's um, and, and so it does give you a foundation um, to start with. Do we have time for one or two more questions? Yeah. I have another oh. question from online. Okay. okay, online question. Okay. Uh, yeah, one from John who says, um, and I guess this gets to this question of, it seems that maybe often third sector organizations um, might be better, but what are the barriers to them winning public contracts? And is there anything that public bodies can do when they're awarding these contracts that might overcome those barriers? Small, small, smaller firm. Nonprofits, you're speaking. Nonprofit. Um, I mean, the, you, that I think it, one can solve, but there has got to be a determination. If, if government is going to give out contracts, they have got to create systems which allow them to give it to smaller smaller organizations. They simply don't have those systems in place. There's absolutely nothing. You know, they can set a, they can set a sort of level. They can, you know, uh, change how they could do a two-tier. I mean, there's all sorts of ways you could do it. It's perfectly doable. Um, but um, it would take resources, and that's presumably why they don't do it. So um, I think it's where there's a will for that you could actually and it also might relate to how we do it right um are we creating too many burdens for a small for, dip. for yeah. small and yeah. i know Absolutely. sometimes um even Absolutely. the response needed for contracts yeah. is short and, and yeah. that then yeah. advantages those larger firms that yeah. are are more ready yeah. and prepared um so yeah, the bureaucratic i think it's a really good point the whole bureaucratic process takes up too many resources for a small yeah. enterprise. So you've got to look at another way of doing that. There was a question right behind you, Michael. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for everything you have shared. My name is Paola. I'm from Costa Rica. Um, I can definitely see how the UK government has advanced faster than some of the governments in Latin America, and which makes me wonder while I was listening to you, it seems as if you built all of this knowledge, right? That's that because you they had what, you what? built you you created or because you have been there for so long just pushing on this and so on but the challenges that we have right now as as a society right don't have perhaps the decades uh, that would require a government to actually develop that knowledge so what would be some of the advice you would give to younger politicians that want to drive these type of change in their countries Hmm. <laughs> I always feel rather uh, reluctant, wary, uh, particularly after the Boris Johnson era of saying we do anything well here in, in the UK, <laughs> uh, because there was a lot went wrong there, in, particularly in this area. <laughs> well, you've got your, yep, 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 yep. Um, I mean, I wish we were better at sharing across. I mean, one of, one of the good things now, my work that I do on... Um, the battle, the, the, you know, the campaign against dirty money, because we're all online, I do now have regular sessions with colleagues in Canada, America, and Europe, and we all meet online and share what we're doing. For example, in seizing assets, you know, uh, Russian assets that have been seized, they're frozen, can we seize them and repurpose them to help Ukraine? That's the sort of thing we're looking at at the moment. So um, we are bad. We're very... We are very, in, well, you're not here, but that, I mean, that's the joy of this uh, institution is that it is so international and it's so ethos and, and way it works, but we are bad. And we always think the Brits do it better and, oh, it's, it, you know, it's, it, we're bad at that. So um, I'd love us to learn from you uh, as well as uh, you, you know, we share with you the experience we've got. I think we've got, we know, I think we know what we do. I think this sort of, you know, trying to get a better relationship. I think that's a really hard nut to crack. I don't know quite. I think maybe there's something in putting the citizen at the heart yeah. and thinking through what does that mean in terms of structures and processes and 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 ways in which people work and would that lead to a more co cooperative? That might be 
Yeah. I'm going to think about that, but I think if, that if might we be. think about public value, it is in fact looking at what's good for the public. And how do you figure that out? You have to center the public yeah. in it. And so that is house. something yeah. that um, I think we've all agreed in this conference. We have yeah. more work to do, but it's but there are, you know, there's innovation. And this conference has highlighted a lot of that kind of innovation mm -hmm. and innovative thinking and practice um, in various sectors. So I'm getting the signal that we are out of time for questions. So I would just, um, it's been an honor to have you with us Sorry, close so this yeah. conference um, on on such important notes. And uh, let's just give a round of applause for Dan Margaret.